Welcome to Old Fashioned Catholics. I'm Kevin. I'm Nick. And we are two Catholic dads who like drinking old fashions. That's why we have that clever play on words. I am name. actually drinking an old fashioned tonight, Nick. Are you really? Yep. Yep. So if you want to join along with us with a drink in your hand, we will give you a chance to pause it and get your own, whether it's alcoholic or not, doesn't matter to us, but you can pause it now. So I am actually drinking old fashioned. Um, I was excited to tell you about this because I found these cherries. Um, I, I forget what they're called. I should run up and get them. I don't actually want to go that far, but they are sour cherries okay. in syrup. And, and so they taste much more like cherries you'd find in a cherry pie. Oh, okay. Oh, so good. This old fashioned is so good right now. Hang on. What's up, bud? What's up? Do you just want to know that everything's okay? Everything's okay. Kevin, say hi to Davey. Hey, Davey. Hi. All right, now you got to go back to bed. Yeah. But I'm right up here. You'll be able to hear me. We're going to get loud and rowdy tonight. All right? Because it's the Easter octave. Sleep well. That's why. Okay, That's so why. You're, you're a new Catholic, so you don't really get that. Um Every day this week is Easter Sunday, so I hope you're yeah. eating and drinking merrily. Well, that's the thing. So I'm, I've been on. I was going to hardcore do this two days a week, big fasts, at least twenty four hours a day, or at least twenty four hours t- twice a week, just till May, um, shaving off the love handles. And um, Jacelyn, yesterday, uh, which I was something I was trying to do the whole day. And she's like, don't you want some of the lamb that we had from Sunday? And I'm like, no, it's my Monday. And she's like, I don't think you understand what today is. And, and she's like, um, I think we're all <laughs> going to be eating. And I said, all right, I respond to guilt better than anybody. So I ate a ton of lamb. So, but wait, yes. before, just wait, I want to know what's, what's in your old fashioned. This is my Northwoods old fashioned. It's oh, okay. my standard Evan Williams bourbon. And it's got, uh, it's called a, like a, a Kona Kona orange or a, it's a, some orange with kind of like a redder flesh. Fun. And then those sour cherries, uh, maple syrup and water, you know, just to dilute it. Nice. It's really good. It's good. Man. It's good. Love, I can't wait to get to the end to eat those cherries at the bottom. I put three in. Oh, see, I, I did too. So I got, I was oh, oh, real quick though. I got a different kind of bitters. You might've heard it. It's like, uh, like D's. D's bitters or something. D's family. Really? Yeah. D's. Yeah. No, I haven't heard. It's a different know. flavor. It's still the aromatic bitters, but it definitely tastes different than the traditional Angostura. You're the bitters guy, though. Like, this is the third type of bitters you've tried, I think, or fourth or something. Like, yeah. You- it's got a very specific quality. I'm trying to pick out what that flavor is. It's very distinct from Angostura. So they both have their place because they are that different. That's cool. That's awesome. I haven't branched out in bitters at all. I have not seen anything but Angostura up here. So, okay. um, I uh, th- this was this was on sale. Bullet Rye. So, oh, so good. I know. I smelled it and I was just like, <laughs> it's beautiful. And then just the normal. Actually, I I tried to back off tonight. I just I just did three dashes, three dashes of bitters, and I stopped. I wanted more, but I didn't. And then two cherries. And I didn't even do the water. I did a sugar cube, though. I'm back to the sugar cube. It's fun yeah. to grind it. You watch it soak up the, the bitters, and it gets all soft. Uh, it's, a, it's an event. And then you you know, you're watching it happen. A little taste on the end. So good. So yeah. Sugar cube. I'll try the sugar cube sometime. It'll probably well, be after you move out of the country. That I'll, yeah. find I'll, and I'll be eating my feelings and eating sugar cubes, and I'll put one in a drink. <laughs> eating my feelings. <laughs> well, I was thinking about it. Like, I, I could do... 10 in the morning and you could do 10 at night and we could still do this wherever I am. If it's 12 hours difference. It's no big yeah. Deal. We did. We talked about that in a previous yeah. video. It's oh, we did. We'll just happen. Cut that. Yeah. yeah. It's going to have that. And you'll have crazy stories. Like yeah. you'll be like, Hey, I saw a kid today and he was skating on one rollerblade down <laughs> the dirt road. Wait, stop. Do we, we already, we already talked about that. Okay. All right. Sorry. We did. Right. We talked about what? Are you kidding? No, I just imagine if you're in Cambodia, there's going to be like, you're, you're, you're going to see, you're, 
you're gonna see crazy stuff whatever like a kid who instead of having two rollerblades just has one and just or like a bike like hey i have a bike it's a unicycle but it's really a bike it just has one wheel no but you did what did we never talked about this are you kidding me we wrote a song called one rollerblade boy who did me and jacelyn because of our time in cambodia we crossed are you kidding me explain here share the brain this is so awesome we we said we're going to cambodia and we we took a, a three dollar air conditioned bus from bangkok to the border we cross over the border into cambodia and we get in this like dirty dusty little van taxi and we start taking off out of town before we get in we watch the police cane pole just cane pole a 12 year old kid till the cane pole was like swinging on its and I talked to the driver. I was like, well, they should stop. And he said, no, no, he's a very bad kid. And I was like, oh, pro- no. Mm, okay. Let's just get in the car. Let's go. So we get in. And as we leave town, Jason looks back and she taps me. And we see a kid in the dust on one rollerblade pushing himself through the square. I can't believe you. Like out of all the things you would pick out of the ether that that we did. And Jason, she wrote a song. We, we still sing it. It's one rollerblade boy. <laughs> you, nobody sees you. <laughs> one rollerblade boy. We, it's like, we sing it all the time. Like, I just can't believe that's so weird. Like, that's not even a, a segue. You just. I'm punking you so good. You told me oh. that story. You son of a. <laughs> Okay, we- I forgot about the song though. That's amazing. Oh. One rollerblade boy. I see. That reminds me of another song because yeah. you have rye whiskey, and it's the song Tennessee whiskey, which is a great song. It's such Tennessee a gorgeous song. Tennessee whiskey, but for everybody, if you're tuning in and you want to be inspired, reach out to me, and I will share with you people from singing competitions that will move you emotionally. But there's this guy from Australia's Got Talent that sang that song for his audition a couple years ago and ended up winning the whole thing. But his rendition of it was the bomb. What was his name? Uh, Judah Kelly. Oh, okay. No. Judah, and they, by the end of the competition, they were calling him King Judah. Really? Yeah. And he was this big dude, like this big kind of shy dude that just wailed on the guitar and could sing like nothing else and it was so cool i that was in the background somebody named mac uh i don't know the last name mac somebody um was in the background of a video a tiktok video i saw the other day and i was like man that is a gorgeous hey that song is so just perfect like yeah. it's so good but then yeah. his voice was all yeah. raspy and gorgeous yeah. yeah i think i like rye whiskey better than tennessee whiskey yep but the song is great you, which reminds me for our next video this needs to be a teaser yeah. our our favorite videos on the internet super show yep where you and i just share our favorite videos that we can remember from all time yeah we tried it once we were like we got this we we're internet folks and then it it, it we just couldn't figure out the tech like the videos were cool we just we messed up so we'll we'll get it right yeah, we'll get it right. You, we might have you, to use a different service. Sorry, Zoom. I'm not sorry, Zoom. Are you pledging that we're going to do this for the next episode or, or just coming down the pike? It's coming down the pike. Okay. It's coming down the pike. Might never, we, might, we might have a guest for the next one. I don't know. We do. We know. have a couple of guests lined up. I did want to say that we don't have, we, we have no topic tonight. We just have each other. Yeah. So what I want to talk about is weak ass preaching from the pulpit. That's what I want to talk about. <laughs> Guess what? If you don't have a charism for preaching, you don't get to be up there if you're not a priest. Okay. So I'm, I guess I'm targeting deacons, but that's that's. Not I was going to ask, like, so you're 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 talking about some deacons you've seen? Yeah. Well, across the world, across the country. Okay. Why is it a thing that by default your deacon gets to preach yeah. once a month or however often it is, if he's bad at it? The yeah. stakes are too high, man. Yeah. Like if you're a priest and you're at all better than the deacon at preaching at all better guess what you're the priest right so you should just do it all the time and someone yeah, should agree. tell you that you're better yeah or you probably already know i agree but there's like oh we have to pretend like deacons are really important and they have this really important role so let's make sure that they get to preach once a month and let's let them tell everyone to go in peace 
like the does that bug does that bug you? Being a deacon used <laughs> to have so many responsibilities, right? And if you're a deacon and you're watching this, I am not trying to denigrate what you do because right. I might become a deacon someday, but it has been so minimized over the last 60 years, so yeah. minimized. Like deacons in the early church used to be exorcists. That used to be one of the things like they just, it was just so different. I didn't know that. That's cool. Oh my gosh. Keep going. St. Stephen, St. Stephen was a deacon. He was? Yeah. How different is St. Stephen getting stoned to death for the faith from the go in peace? <laughs> Like you got your one line at the end of mass. Well, that's what it feels like. It feels like, okay, we, are we, did you want to say, you want to say your line? Okay. Like it could be over and the priest could do it, but we got to give Phil. Why, why are deacons glorified altar servers? Yeah. I don't know. That's the problem. I don't know anything. I know that from the beginning, knowing that I can't, I will never be a priest. I, and having, having only one skill, I just, it's a horrible how many bad homilies everyone can give, how many bad homilies you can hear, especially when you're like going yeah. around the country. And that's, I've always thought like, man, I would just kill to be a deacon just to get to preach. Like I could, I could preach. That's I, I can do that. Preach, man. Preach, man. Yeah. But, um, I, okay, dude, I, I, I just got to back up a, a step because like, if there is a deacon watching, we, we had a video with a deacon and he was awesome. And mm. I'm, I'm probably offending some deacons out there. Well, and but, I apologize. I but, am. I am grossly generalizing right now. Well, grossly generalizing, but again, if you're listening and you're a deacon, like he was saying, the weight of responsibility of a deacon, it has so very little to do with the homily that you can give on Sunday. Like it's, those are like, it's, that's a tangent. Being a deacon is so other, like the weight that, I mean, if you're, yeah. if you are a deacon, just, you can't take offense because it has, you've heard bad deacons preach. I mean, you've had right. deacons. Right. I'm, I'm only talking about, Right now, I, I would talk about deacons being glorified all service, blah, 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 blah. I get like deacons have, have major roles. They can officiate weddings and baptisms. Like you can do awesome stuff. You can do awesome stuff as a deacon. You can preach. Therefore, if you aren't good at preaching, that is what you should be working on. Right. Because that's the one thing you get to do. Oh, man. Duh. I just, I think, and, and it's just me, because that's what I've tried to, that's all I do is talk. I just think anytime, I mean, in general, anytime somebody asks, Hey, will you give a five minute talk on something? I just think you, you should, if somebody's asking you to stand in front of people and impart like the gospel or, or God's word to them, you that's you you can't you can't treat it lightly you cannot treat it lightly and and for a deacon i mean i get it like it doesn't you might say well but i'm not good at that we'll get good at that that's like that's yeah. that's a huge responsibility yeah. well Je i mean jesus even says and he's talking about rabbis but if, if you don't be don't be eager to be a teacher right oh, no, jesus that might be paul no that's jesus don't be eager to be a teacher it'd be better it'd be better for you if you had a millstone tied around your neck than to lead like little ones astray like that's huge if you're going to extend breath and or expend breath on the gospel you better have practiced it like i mean it, i i would say like at least six times on yeah. your feet out loud at home practice it over and over yeah yeah and so practically speaking if you're going to practice it don't get to game day. Don't get to the Sunday homily and paraphrase and restate the readings and gospel as your right. homily. Yeah. That's not, a, that's not a homily. We already heard that. You can't just retell it. <laughs> also, don't start your homily with when I was a kid. Don't, <laughs> don't even do it because <laughs> nobody cares. Nobody's sitting out there Right. who is Kevin, I, contracepting or sterilized true. or goes to mass when they feel like it cares about what you did when you were a kid, man. Right. Keep going. I shouldn't. I, I just shouldn't. Okay. This is, this is deacon prep right now. You're prepping to be a deacon someday. All right. So funny deacon pet peeves. All right. When Pause. <laughs> the... Again, this has nothing to do with the with responsibilities of a deacon. This is just, you see this deacon for an hour and these are the pet peeves. Go. Deacon We're going to get so many bad, go ahead. I know this is going to get more dislikes than likes for sure. <sighs> for sure. And 
I have I have friends who are deacons and are good deacons. I'm not talking about them. You know what I mean? Like this is like the world. I've been to a lot of churches. You've been to a lot of churches. I've heard a lot of deacons preach. I'm not talking about like it's okay. It's okay. okay. We're it's fine. Okay. So deacon pet peeves when they start their homily with when I was a kid to when they spend half of their homily just paraphrasing the gospel okay. from the day. All right. Three, when their entire homily feels like they're not even in touch with real people or reality. Those are my three big pet peeves. It's like, what are you even talking about? Like, like you're talking about God up here and out there and people are afraid of going to see their family because of COVID. Like right. what the hell are you talking about? Right. Like get real, man. No, no, I get that. I, I feel that. I feel that again. Well, that, that even steps on more toys. I, I feel that with priests. I just feel like, and again, the tradition I grew up in, you have music and preaching. That's what you have on Sunday. So that's, so you better be really good at it. You better put time into it. And, and when you're not like people will tell you that you're not. And so coming into the Catholic world to come in and be like, I remember, so I would say the first mass we ever went to was with father Mike. That's a little bit of a, a mistake because we, when Jason and I went to, we had come back from China. We were going to hike the Appalachian trail. We failed at that. We bailed out and we went to Vermont because that's, we were near Vermont and we went to the Von Trapp family lodge, like where the actual Von Trapps settled their lodge when they came to America. And, and they actually, you know, they were strong Catholics and they had this chapel out in the woods that they had made. And they, when they were in the war, they pledged, if you bring us home, then we'll build this chapel. We'd seen all this. Well, Sunday morning came and we were pretty disillusioned with everything we grew up. And so we went to a mass. I don't remember anything about it. I remember, well, I remember two things. One, um, that was the first time I saw people like uh, communion as we knew it. They went so fast. It was just like the whole church was done in like seven minutes. But the other thing was the first homily that I ever heard in a Catholic church ever was the priest stood up and he said, one time Mary decided to bake a cake. And so he's making, she's making this cake and she keeps Mm, it doesn't taste right. And she would mix some more sugar and then she would taste it and mm, it doesn't taste right. And then Jesus came along and, and he put his finger in it and she tasted it and said, ah, that's right, son, because Jesus put love in the cake. And then he went and sat back down. And so his whole homily was 30 seconds and that's all it was. And Jason and I were like, Catholics are lunatics. This is absurd. Like, this is like, I, I just, I remember thinking like that was you, you squandered these people around you. They don't come to any other, the Bible studies and the small groups and anything. This is the Bible. This is the only chance you get with people once a week as a priest or a deacon. This is, this is your one shot. Do not miss your chance to blow. This opportunity comes once in a lifetime. In a lifetime. Oh, you lose yourself like, in the moment. <laughs> nope, that was wrong. Don't don't mess with Eminem. Um, but don't. I just remember thinking that, like you, you get people at mass. A lot of them are there for guilt. A lot of them are there for um, just it's mechanical. They go. They've people always gone. They will never come to anything else, and to squander it with things like that. Like well, when I was a kid, not that. Although I don't have a problem with that because I. I use that when I was a kid a lot, but just that idea, even for priests, like, dude, you have God brought the Holy spirit brought these people here today and you're expelling the air in your lungs. Like that's on your shoulders. You, you better dang well, bring them closer to heaven. Like you, yeah. you, you, you need to, you have to like, you have to do it over and over at home and get the ums out and the paces out and the, it's its own craft. It's its own like art that you need to get better at because because what happens is they do. They're like, well, I have all these other duties. And so this kind of falls. And they're the important. Wayside. And they are. But if you think about it, like, OK, so again, we should pause. This is not. The, the weight on a priest or, or deacons is different than married men. It's fundamentally different. And we don't know. It's so different. So different. At the same time, it's not but but at the same time. 
everybody, so you're doing shut-ins, you're going to visit shut-ins, shut-ins, and you're doing the funerals and you're doing the, all these, those are all the Catholic world oriented, but at the mass, you get people who will never come to anything else. They won't. They're, they're in, they're in broken marriages and they're in broken relationships and their, their, their lives are tanking, but they still come for some reason, whether it's guilt or whatever. And you have this moment to get into their hearts and to bring Christ closer to them, not just physically, but actually like, so they are aware of it and, and it gets squandered all the time. And that's not a judgment that something can be a, a truth and not a judgment. It can be true that priests and deacons squander that homily and it's not a judgment on them in the sense of like, you're a bad person, but that's a huge responsibility because they're, yeah. they're- I, I, but in, I think in a sense, there is a judgment there that if you are not spending time if you are getting a platform with a captive audience of sinners and misfits, people who are just there, whoever happens to be there, some people are parishioners, some are visiting, some people are there by choice, some people aren't, and you aren't spending time, real time, doing the absolute best you can, then you are responsible for that. Yeah. Yeah. And oh, it's, it's true. That's on your shoulders. I mean, you could look at it as God gave you an hour with people who will not come, no matter how great the event is, they're not going to come again until next Sunday morning at 1030. And God gave you them for an hour. Mm-hmm. And granted, most of that is the liturgy of the Eucharist. And, and, and that's what really matters. And, and I would have given my whole life. I would trade everything to have even mindlessly be, been receiving the Eucharist my whole life. Like, you know how like people just go up, they don't even care. Okay. I would take that to have never had it until I was 29 years old. I would trade all of that. So it's not even dissing the people in the pews who don't know. It's, it's, it's just saying like you have, you have like 15 minutes that they're open to listening to you. Yeah. And like yeah. you said, they don't care. They don't care when you were a kid, they, they, their soul is in peril or their soul is in need of nurturing and drawing closer to God. And they're again, and, and this is where, yeah, I'm speaking. Preaching is, it's a craft and it takes yeah. effort. And I mean, like, honestly, dude, I remember the first time I ever heard you speak. It was before you were, your craft was where it is now. So for those of you who have heard Nick speak, you know, that there is, there is the power of the Holy spirit in his words. You're like, he, he has that gift and he hones and he practices. So Nick, just don't shake your head or not or anything. Just take it. So he drink he practices so much so that everything he's saying, he's practicing what he preaches. Like, so that what he's saying can be fulfilled, that God can work through him as much as possible. But I heard you, one of your first ever talks, it was at a confirmation retreat uh-huh. and you were bad. Like <laughs> you were bad bad at it and i was in college and i thought dang nick this is rough and guess what you got better because you practiced and well no i remember you telling me that i i remember when i was in high school i told you that before yeah you've told me many times it maybe oh, too many bad. times maybe you tell it me it must too. really stick in my memory as being really bad you <laughs> must have actually because i remember the first time you told me that really kicked me into a like a higher gear of like oh man because i thought i did well and like, so that that like like sort of like no no just don't ever settle you're, you're never doing well just keep trying harder but when i was in high school um and that was over i guess that was between 11th and 12th grade our church did a mission thing in minneapolis and i got to i think somebody asked me to give a testimony i spoke for like 60 seconds first time ever in front of people and i loved it and I, I was like, yeah, I think this is it. And I remember my best friend after I was like, man, that was so fun. And uh, I think, you know, I think I want to do this. And he was like, dude, you're horrible. <laughs> you're, and I was like, what? He's like, yeah, that sucked, man. And I remember thinking like, well, I, it doesn't change the fact that it was the greatest for me. Like I loved being there, but okay. Then there's a disparity between what I like perceived happening and what they did. It's probably the same with priests and deacons. I know that when you go to seminary, they're not training like orators, you know, they're training, they're it's holy orders and they have their priesthood and it's different, but I would be willing to bet that a a large number of people who, who 
like attrition out. Uh, it's because, well, I was coming every Sunday and it was, it was the same thing all the time. So I was just out. It was the same homily. Yeah. My, I remember my sister talking about church. She was going to out West and the priest said these, the same homily every week. Jeez. Same. It was just the same homily every week. And that, that is just, that's atrocious to me. I just can't even fathom. So if, and this, I don't know if this is where to go with, I don't know where we're going with the conversation. If you could say there is an area. Okay. Well, well, I'll, I'll, I'll pause. If we should cover it in, in an episode of old fashioned Catholics, <laughs> <laughs> if there is a, an area or yeah, an area of the faith that you think people are shying away from, but really should be spoken of. What would it be? But but only if you think it fits in with the uh, ethic of our show. Yeah. 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 No, I, I yeah. got you here. Yeah. You got me? I feel you, man. I feel, feel you. Me. You feel me, Kevin? Um, I think that it is what St. John Paul II pointed out in that there is a loss of a sense of personal responsibility personal sin okay so like i can be the the average catholic sitting in the pew and i can be listening to a homily encouraging me to go to confession or or talking about sin and i don't even know what my sins are I don't even know in the ways that I've walked away from God because I have lived in this kind of law and it has not been talked about from the pulpit for so long. So, so we have a lot of good priests in our diocese, yeah. but there are issues that have not been talked about from the pulpit for so many decades yeah. that my wife just said this to me today. She said that they like in their wisdom, probably they recognize that it's not fair to just spring it on people hmm. things that they haven't known sure are keeping them from from god for hmm. so so long but on the flip side that's your responsibility right like how am i supposed to know what the right path is if i don't know what the wrong path is so it's just like mm, jesus is mercy and that's all he is which is not biblical but all right. it is is just show up and and love and and happiness and and it's reflected in music too um right. we'll get to that in a different episode but i mean how many of our songs how many of our hymns are not even songs to god we're right. like singing about ourselves yep. and how we feel yeah like gather us in the proud and the lowly let's talk about ourselves that if that isn't a like <laughs> a, like if that isn't a glaring symptom yeah. of like self-centeredness and a lost way i don't know what else is but you you had a thought sorry i lost it in in dang it <laughs> yeah there is a, there is an amazing video of stephen colbert from like the 80s yes king of glory who yep. is the king of glory <laughs> and he gets out of breath by the end of it it's so good <laughs> That's not from the eighties. That's from that's recent. I mean, it's maybe in the last eight nine years. No, no. There's an old one. There's an old one of it. He's in. He's in his old his old Sunday school room. It's old though. Yeah. Okay. It's probably old. They just showed a clip. Maybe it's from the nineties. I don't know. It, it's it looks really old. Agree to disagree. Agree to disagree. So, okay, go back because I did have something. It was. I don't. I don't want to because we'll do an episode on music. We could do an episode. On yeah. Music. Let's not get into that. It's not gonna that. Shoot, I lost it. It's no big deal. It was going back. Oh, it was okay. Um, yes. Personal sin. So, have you watched The Chosen yet? Um, my wife's watching it. She loves it. Um, I, I thought it was really lame. Oh man, I'm sorry, Kevin. You're wrong. That's okay. It's getting no. It's okay to be um, wrong. Tell me your true thoughts. We, we we finished season one, and I, apart from like I, th I, I like one episode that I was like, well. After the fact, it was awesome. During, it wasn't like engaging. I love it. I love the show so much. And now I, and J Jonathan Rumi, he's a really strong Catholic. He's played Jesus like five times in his acting career. I, um, 
I just love there was the guy a guy playing Jesus is Catholic. Yeah. Strong. Nice. Yeah. It's, it's so cool. Anyway, there was a scene where I'm pretty sure it was the scene where they lower the paralytic in, but anyway, how many episodes have you seen? Half of a couple. Oh, you, you should probably watch the whole thing. Trust me. He's in a season two. I, there's, there's things I can't get past, but continue. I'm, I'm open-minded. Please do. I, I'm not, I mean, I'm not unaware of the, there, I, I'm not unaware of things, but the good far outweighs <laughs> the bad things. <laughs> so anyway, there is a scene, like I, I keep expecting Jesus, modern Jesus is not historical Jesus. I'll say that. That's, that keeps it nice. And if you're mad at even that, just take a sip of something. Oh, I've already made whoever's going to be mad, mad enough. You're so much more diplomatic than I am. So anyway, the Jesus in here, at one point, he says, oh, how did they phrase it? They do. They scared me because uh, there's a scene. Yeah, it is that scene. He's there. He's preaching to people. And the there's a couple of Pharisees looking in the window and he makes this half of a sentence statement where he's like ba basically and this is paraphrasing but basically everybody is the same like there, there's nobody worse than anybody else and you're like ah please don't please don't do this and then he says and it's almost like they made a point like they brought you to that and they're like hold up and jesus says twice he says all shall repent and believe and he says it twice and i was like in the house just being like Dah! like yes everybody like it's not yes everybody is the same it's true we're all in the same boat but we all have to like own up and own our personal responsibility and repent and then believe and it was it was like it was it was like that one good confession i like i've had a, every confession is good but that one confession i had where the priest was like crying with me in the pulpit like it was jesus same like no no no, everybody's the same but y'all have to repent you have to like own your personal responsibility and i would agree i would say that you don't you don't hear that fleshed out at least you don't hear it fleshed out well from the pulpit personal responsibility with the other that's the problem like it's you have one or the other you have people generally who like they're fire and brimstone which is real fire and brimstone comes from right, the bible and then you have, it's, it's all fine, which it is all fine through God's grace. Like everything, it all shall be made well and all shall be made well and all manner of things will be made well. That's true as well, but it all comes from virtue lying in the middle. And you don't, you don't hear that preached very much because that's really difficult to preach well because you lose some and uh, they get really mad at you these days. Yeah. So, yeah and the, kind of the fire and brimstone side, like they're, they're, purpose or what they're trying to get is people to be convicted right but then right. once you have people convicted what you have to remind them of is how not hopeless it is yeah yep and so you have the hopelessness and the fire and brimstone and everything's going down and then you, and there's no, there's a lack of ability to cross over and say all right now that you're convicted here's here's the reality of god's mercy and then you have the people over here which is you know, we're just not going to mention it. We're going to leave it up to every individual Catholic to know what morality is and how it how it affects their family and their lives. Well, in every four years, you get like, don't you leave it up to your conscience. You have to vote your conscience. Yeah, but you have to well have a well-formed conscience. Yeah. And how do you get a well-formed conscience if it hasn't been formed? Yeah, if you're if your one experience of God is one hour a week. And your formation, your formation part for the week is a five to 15 minute homily. If that formation isn't amazing, you're not getting any formation. Yeah. So why are we surprised that we have generations of yeah. Catholics who aren't formed that don't know right from wrong? Or maybe they could say, yeah, the, the church says that's, that's a sin, but. You know, it's up to my personal 
beliefs. That doesn't well, and sense. even that, like the idea, okay, it, it's, I remember uh, I've only spoken with my biological father, like, like 15 times in my life. Um, and in one of our conversations, we had, it, I was, I was 18 and I was trying to like bring up Jesus to him. And he was basically like, well, I got you to scoot me in the back door. Like I could just ba- basically like sc- scoot on in just barely. And I remember saying like, is that how you want to live your life? Like just barely, like if, if there is, if there's a God. And I always think of, so when we're talking about people in the pews, again, if you happen to be somebody who just stumbled upon old fashioned Catholics and you're like, yeah, cause you like old fashions and you're sitting here listening. You're like, man, I, f- I feel like you're being really judgy. First of all. Yeah. I mean, God is, judgy in in the right sense but not in the way you mean it but the other side is that um it's not judgy if you didn't know like if you have spent your life going to mass and no one has told you like actuality that's on them like there's a good chance they're going to hell for your soul like they're they're like which is a pause the other day or just on easter sunday the priest in our town Father Thomas, he said from the pulpit, he was talking about Fridays during the rest of the year, how Fridays, every Friday of the year, you're supposed to abstain from meat. And he's like, and I'm just saying that because, listen, if you don't know, it's my fault. And if you do know, listen, I'm not going to hell for all you people. And, <laughs> and everybody laughed like they genuinely laughed at it, which is more than I falls. No one ever laughs up here. But like the idea that like, if you're in the pews and you didn't know, okay, well, that God's not up there miffed at something you didn't know. Right. You're fine. You're, you're fine. But once you do know, like culpability is awesome, but it's a, it's a, it's a tough thing to handle. Like culpability is, is good and bad at the same time. And for, for people to know the actuality of what they're in a it's on the priests to give it to them. And then, and then B it's on you to, if the priest has done it right in conjunction with the Holy spirit, who is the one who actually convicts, then you will get to the point where you're like, okay, listen, I, I, I didn't know. I'm sorry. I didn't know. And now I do. And I see it in the light of mercy, like divine mercy is coming up when we're filming this divine mercy. That's all. That's all true. That's the other side. That's over here then in the middle, then I'll like, okay, I didn't know God's patient with me. Like, I'm not mad at my kids for things they didn't know, but once they know, then the important thing is that the priest or the deacon leads them into that depth of relationship where you can trust his mercy and hit the confessional and then move on. Yeah. And there can be this sense where it's like, dang, Nick, isn't it better just not to know? Like why? I don't want to know it. I just want to go like this and be like, okay, I just want to live my little Catholic bubble life and go to mass once a week and just just live in this bubble and uh th- to that i would say no you right. want to know unequivocally you want to know unequivocally you want to know like nick you could have said i don't want to know that i'm not great at speaking yet i just want i feel like it's great i get fulfillment out of it right but in order to find your true potential you had to know what yeah. things are going to help that and what things aren't as a speaker, right? Just in a, just to use a metaphor that we've used before. Yeah. And now you have the gift that you've honed, you've tuned it, you've sharpened it that you can use and other people's lives can be changed. And you had to know at the get go, you right. couldn't just live in ignorant bliss. And was- there are people in as speakers, there are, there are probably deacons who live in ignorant bliss. There are priests who live in <laughs> ignorant bliss. The fact that they're just not gifted at it. Or there are people who live in ignorant bliss that they're terrible singers. You know, you see that on all of the fun, uh, like the voice. Or yeah. It's like, okay, you're not a gifted singer and you live in an ignorant bliss, but it's better to know. Cause you just feel sorry for those people that don't know. Right. Like, you don't learn anything from them. You just feel bad for them. And you're like, Oh, how quaint. The other thing is at at some point along the way of becoming Catholic and like having to hit the confessional all the time and having that like constant, like shaving down, like I I would tell the kids, like when I tell them like, no, that was, that was not right. I was, I go tink, tink, tink. Cause we talked about like, you know, when there's a chunk of rock and you like 
sculpt it. It's just tink, 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 little bits mm-hmm. at a time. Mm-hmm. There are times when, you know, you're working on your life. Generally, you're, you're trying in little ways each day to give up to God. But then there are times when the Holy Spirit comes along and is like, oh, by the way, this is a glaring inconsistency and you're quite evil in this area. And generally, after finding confession, my response is like, holy cow, thank God. I didn't know I was so horrible. Like, just to know, like, because wouldn't you, again, and, and then again, this is pause. If you struggle with insecurity and self-image, A, that's, that's, that's a lot of other people's fault. And B, it is not a judgment on you as a human being. If you just take a second and recognize how bad you are at something. You know, like I can, I could, Kevin could like take me aside tonight and be like, Nick, I, th- I think you think a, you're, you're still, you still suck. Like I've listened to you speak. And you still suck and it's okay. You're working at it. Keep going, buddy. Um, I, there's something so liberating in realizing how wrong you are mm-hmm. and having like not, not believed in the church and then found the church. There's something so like, Oh my gosh, I was wrong on almost everything. That's awesome. Because as soon as you know where you're wrong, you can be closer to the truth. And Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And so in our lives, like we should be excited to know where we're doing it wrong. It shouldn't be a weight. It should be an excitement. Like an, it should be a weight off your shoulders. And we don't, we don't accept that kind of criticism from just anybody, right? Like, like I am, like you are free to, receive criticism from someone and able to receive it to the degree that that person or that entity loves you and has your right. well-being in mind otherwise yeah it doesn't matter it right. doesn't matter and so the question that becomes is the question becomes does the church that jesus christ established have my best interest in mind right. and if she does then <laughs> what she says matters and and what I do matters. And if she doesn't have my well-being in mind, why am I going? Like, why do I even care? No, I know. It's I was simple. I've been saying that lately uh, with the with the precepts of the church, the five precepts of the church, or any of the the rules that you get, the the rules, the empty traditions that you get from the church. If you approach any one of them, you know, because we always approach the rules with like, but why? But why, like a little kid, if you approach them with that, instead of approaching like that, if you approach the rules of the church, five precepts, whatever, and just say, okay, whatever it is, I understand that the church's answer is so that you'll stay close to Jesus. But why? So that you'll be close to Jesus. But why? This is so stupid. So that you'll stay close to Jesus. If you approach any of the church's teachings like that, everything changes because then you're like, Oh my gosh. Okay. Wow. So, so this is so that I can stay close to Jesus. Like I, that changes everything for every Catholic in the pew, like for everybody who might be feeling uh, like, well, why does the church expect all these things of me so that you can stay close to Jesus? Because that is all that matters. Christ is all that matters to the church, to, to your life. That's all that matters. So, yeah, I, I guess. And again, if preachers, then if people preaching from the pulpit, whoever you are, if you get a chance to get up in front of people and deliver home some message of the gospel of God's love, then you, while you're practicing it at home five or six times on your feet out loud, then you should keep that in mind of just like, it's okay. It's so that they can be closer to Jesus. It's so that they can be closer to Jesus. Not so they, if, if they're going to feel guilt, great. I want my kids to feel guilty for the bad things they've done so that they can be more closer to Jesus. Like that, that's the end all. I want to be a better husband so that my wife will be closer to Jesus. Like mm-hmm. I want to be a better father so that my kids will be closer to Jesus. And as a priest or a deacon, so that they can be closer to Jesus. Yeah. I mean, that's really the perfect metaphor when you think about marriage and it's like, all right, if there's something that I'm doing that is uh, hurting or offending my spouse and I don't know it, if I love my spouse, do I want to hear what that thing is so that I can stop the thing or fix whatever the thing is that's hurting her? Yep. Yeah. I want to know. 
and marriage is the image of Christ's love for the church and our relationship with Christ. So if we are doing something that is damaging or hurting our relationship with God, then we should absolutely want to know. If we don't want to know what it is, then maybe that's where we need to start and say, mm-hmm. I don't really want to be as close to God right now as I think I do, because I don't want to know. I don't want to know how I'm hurting him. I don't know how, how I'm hurting myself mostly. And if we can come to terms with that and say, I do want to know, then that's where true human potential is met. And that's, you know, that's you finding the church. That's you entering into the mission field like you have in your life. It's like, you, like you came to these realizations and how, how helpless you were on your own, in a sense, and said, here is God inviting me in and he's going to bring me to a new level and then a new level and a new level as long as I continue to focus directly on him and how can I best be in friendship with him? I don't know. That's, I'm just streaming thought here at this point, but. No, that's crazy. That's, that would be at the heart of everything. Like that, even going back to like your frustrations with preaching of like, of a homily. Um, it's funny how everything is part. It's, it's all of a part. Like it's all of a piece. Like, so as a husband relating to his wife, and if you're listening, if you're a woman, then, you know, relating to your husband or relating to the person you're dating or relating to Jesus, it's weird. There's no dynamic, whether it's vertical with God or horizontal with human relationships, there's no dynamic, which at any point, the ultimate good for the other person sitting across the table from you, whoever it is, could be your kid, your spouse, somebody you've never met, your first date, whatever, it doesn't matter. The person sitting across from you, the ultimate good for that person is always that they can stay closer to Jesus. Always. It's always. So as Kevin and I, we've talked about this ad nauseum, like as husbands, okay, we're like, we're not the best at it, but what, what do we do that can get our wives closer to God then than the, and, and our kids closer to Jesus. But then as priests and deacons, what can you say on Sunday morning that will that will cut through all of the BS that has been shoved at them this week. It's like endless BS, but what can you say to them that will remind them that the entire reason that you're breathing and that you have like blood in your heart and breath in your lungs is that you can be closer to Jesus because he's the only one that lasts. Like what can you say that will do that? And again, then for Kevin and I, like we don't get to preach on Sundays. But when we meet Kevin, especially in his job, like when you meet people, there's always a way, even if it's quiet and subdued, there's always a way to in some way impart the ability to be closer to Jesus. And I'll stop talking. I'll stop talking with this. I remember at a youth ministry thing with uh, youth ministers talking about how I think when it boils down, like every Wednesday night, there's no weight on your shoulders to change somebody's life. Cause the only Holy spirit's the only thing that changes somebody's life. Yeah. The only thing you can do is give opportunities. You can give your spouse, your kids, your youth group, the stranger on the street, you can give them one more opportunity before the day of their death at the hour of their death. You can give them one more opportunity to know Jesus, to know him in a small way. Like you can, everything is an opportunity in that sense. And, and that takes the weight off in the right sense. And it puts the weight on in the right sense for people who preach and people who relay the love of God. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. You know, that just re- everything you're saying there just reminds me of uh, the whole thing I was thinking of during that was, man, I love that we get to be here and it's Easter and we just get to just like break this stuff down. Yeah. And it, it both gives me like a joy that we get to celebrate Easter together um because i love you and it's awesome but also it also gives me a little bit of sadness that i can't share how joyful easter is with people who aren't catholic yeah like, you know my like my my christian friends who aren't catholic it would be weird for me today on you know a couple days after easter sunday to say hey happy easter how's your easter going yeah. be like, what are you talking about and it's like oh my gosh this week is my favorite week of the year it literally is my favorite week of the year ever since I started practicing Lent intentionally and, and celebrating Easter intentionally. And um, 
I don't know where I'm going with that. That's just, I, I just wanted to share that with you. Well, no, like, so, okay. So there's a, is this where the line is in the recording or is it over here? On my end, it's the first one. It's right here. Okay. Yeah. I've noticed after the fact, it's always different, but there's like a dividing line between the upbringing that is not Catholic and the upbringing that it is, or that is. We, Jason and I just mentioned this year, back in the day, one of our churches that we went to um, in our early marriage, Easter Sunday came along and the pastor, who's a great man, like I, I know him personally, he's an amazing man, but Easter Sunday came and the, the music got over and he essentially said something to the effect of, all right, everybody, um, <clears throat> you know, that people celebrate Easter today. Um, and in some circles, it is traditional to say he is risen. He is risen indeed. So we're going to do that. And so he said, he is risen. And then people said, he is risen indeed. He's like, all right. Now that we got that out of the way, let's do this. And then he preached a sermon. And even, even us, like non-traditional, non anything non-liturgical we were like what though like that was that was a resurrection of god like that was everything in a certain sense and um even even us we could recognize that there was something missing and then to find like people like you who were like no no no, this is the greatest week this is this is everything like in a sense of like and i have to like secretly do it (laughs) <laughs> like it's like like when I'm at work and things like that. It's like nobody knows how much fun I'm having at home with my family this week every night. Like they don't know. And like as you're saying, like it just it wasn't a part of hmm. your life. So do you? Well, I suppose in your workplace you can't do all that much. What do you do at home then to celebrate it? Like we just say yes to to our kids for this week so like can i like they have these huge chocolate bunnies and they have all all these things. like dad can i have another yep can i have another yep yep yeah yeah and and we pray every night as a family and so it's all interspersed it's not just candy it's right, not right. just you know celebrating um but it is awesome because it is it is clearly different than how we've been living the past 40 days <laughs> and they know what the reason is. We've told them what the reason is. And we've talked about it at the dinner table. And we're having, you know, we're family dinner people. We eat di- and you do too. And we eat dinner as a family. And yeah. that's important. Um, so a lot of conversations come up. And little, I mean, little kids, four and six-year-olds, ask about and talk about amazing things when you just create that space for it. So it, it is. it is an amazing week. That's so cool, man. That's yeah. So we're, we're like on the, like we're like 15 years behind you in that. Like, we were <laughs> yeah. just talking. And, and that's I, fair because 15 years ago, I didn't do this. Yeah. Right. 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 So we were, and that's where like, even these have encouraged me so much in our family. Jason and I were talking like, um, I can't remember. It was the annunciation feast of the annunciation. Yeah, dude. Cause, cause father Thomas March 25th for all of you, March 25th, March 25th. Cause it's nine months before December 25th. We know that that's not the like it's liturgically correct. There you go. It's liturgically correct. So father Thomas had said, he made a point at mass on Sunday being like, okay, listen, Thursday's coming up. I know we're in Lent, but this is the feast of the annunciation. I want you to eat a bunch. I want you to celebrate. I'm telling you to celebrate. And kind of, it kind of like, it just kind of hit me. I was like, Oh my gosh, I that's, that's harder for me to do to take days and just full on go just ape bonkers to the wall, like just go crazy. And so we told the kids, listen, we're going to be trying to celebrate more of these feasts now because they're wanting us to be celebratory, like to be happy. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to do it. We're going to pig out and we're going to celebrate and we're going to pray more and we're going to do all these things. And um, so we're not there. We're not, where you are yet but like we're trailing behind well and this is important for everybody watching who maybe doesn't do this it's not part of your tradition feasting is not indulgence right if you've practiced fasting like if you can do both then you're you're doing it right right if you know how to fast and if you know how to feast 
and you should not worry about it. Don't take our words wrong. We're not talking about gluttony. Like, right. No well, our even our that's so funny because even our boss in China, when we were we're living overseas, just teaching in China, he used to say all the time, "There's there there is far more feasting in the Bible than fasting. Fasting is real. I mean, it's actual and it's self denial and it's that's real. why everybody's doing it secularly now. Every, right. Like fasting yeah. is the biggest thing right now it's in huge. the fitness world." Because it works. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, but go yeah. figure. God made something work physically. <laughs> I know. Like, it all fits together. I did. I, actually, recently, I looked into um, uh, when it comes to religious fasting, how to teach your kids religious fasting, just the, some concepts. And uh, they're awesome. They're, they're, I guess that'd be a separate episode. We don't need to cover those. Okay. But maybe it would. Write do that a, down, man. I did. It's written right over there. Okay. Let's talk want- about that. Because I want to talk about that. Yeah. And we're, we're already in an hour, so we, we can't. Are we? I tried to check the timestamp a minute ago. But anyway, the, the, just that idea that like, no, 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 God. Well, we talked about it with Bill Donahue, like uh, gratuitous joy, gratuitous yeah. everything. Just that idea like God's like, no, 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 just eat. Like I made your bodies to enjoy that. Just eat. I bet Damn. you anything. I bet you anything. Our guests that we've had on the show are celebrating this week. And I love it. Amen. When I think about uh david and mike and bill like i just all those guys well sister anna marie over in yeah, scotland you know, you know she and her nuns are in scotland right now drinking oh, scotch crazy. you know it because it's daytime there and it's yeah. the easter octave on the bonnie bonnie banks of loch Lomond. that's what they're, they're probably singing. drinking like a beautiful lafrog 15 year no they're just drinking wow. water you know them <laughs> well she was the one who in the interview or in the setup i was like so we always drink something and she's like can it be beer or wine and i was like yeah totally so they drink beer or wine but she came to the table with nothing sister terrible but no i agree i think i and that's actually another reason i like the chosen to be honest they take specific moments to show how in the moment it wouldn't have been stupid for jesus to be happy and laughing like there's, there's a scene, and I won't talk about it too much. And, but I they, mean, they do it badly, but yeah. No, no, they don't. You need to watch farther. It is by far, bar none, the best Christian acting I have ever seen. And I, I will not back down from that. The bar is like, the bar is so low. But they're, they they raise it. I'm, okay. You know just, what? You know what it's not better than? It's not better than the Ten Commandments. We just watched that this weekend again with charlton heston the ten commandments that movie is insane let my people go it's so extra man it's, it is so it's extra awesome. but it's it's too okay listen okay we can't if the chosen is better than the ten commandments not even close the chosen will not win a billion academy <laughs> i don't know wait song. man just just watch watch episode four or five i can't remember which one it is it might be six just watch. it's just so good you know what listen to the narrator on the ten commandments <laughs> and the stuff that he says that's not directly from scripture and you're like right. this writing is flipping brilliant <laughs> when moses is going out into the desert and being broken by god so that he can build him up and use him for his purpose mm-hmm. that was insane it was good it was we showed it at the kids last easter yeah. it's it's good and like it's better than Malibu Jesus. It is. Definitely. And that's how I picture the chosen. It's like Malibu Jesus. No, no. Give it, give it funny accents Mm-mm. that don't match anything. It's like, what accent are you speaking? It's not the same as that guy. That's true. That's true. I I would still... I, I say this to you because I won't taint your love of it and you yeah. like. But you'll I have the hope get, you'll probably get me to cross the fence on it. You will. You'll you will cross the fence because because it is good. Just like the Ten Commandments is good. It, we watched it with the kids and they were engaged. It's it's good cinema. This we were talking about this morning. Like this, the Chosen is it is good. Nothing's perfect when it comes to cinema, but right. like out of every single Christian, well, Shawshank Redemption is perfect. Okay, I don't think so. It's pretty is, close. Is that another episode we're we gonna do? Um, but anyway, shoot, you it's lost a wonderful me. life is perfect. Wait, just 
Okay, uh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yes, you're right, actually. Yeah. You're, we agree that's on perfection. that. It's a wonderful... That, that's cinematic perfection. That episode, we have to stay as a show, Old Fashioned Catholics, till at least next... The next Christmas? Yeah. No. We could cut it and then to be then. All right. But why did... I brought up The Chosen for a reason. I'm throwing you off. I'm sorry. Because uh, you dissed it. It was... What I'll was the reason? I'll keep busy it and I'll, then I'll watch it and then I'll tell you if I like it or not. You will. No, but there was a reason. It was going to be the closeout, too. You ruined oh, shoot. Closeout. I'm sorry. Are you? Yeah. No, I am. I'm actually. Yeah. Good. Well, rewind a second. Oh, I got it. This is what it was. It was the fact that uh, in specific episodes, they make Jesus lighthearted but not like fake cheesy lighthearted but more like as it would have been if a bunch of guys were hanging out and one of them happened to be the son of god but the hypostatic union and he was god and man i think there have been a couple of points where i've been like that's real humor that's like not like comedic humor but that's just that's just a bunch of guys hanging out that's funny and he probably would have said that um there are a couple of times when i thought they did really well with that that's all nice yeah all right yeah you, we you, for, the, for those of you at home my curiosity for those of you at home you don't know that we just deleted um about five minutes where we were debating over the goodness or badness of the chosen and then we lost our train of thought so yeah. <laughs> oh man man that make, i i don't feel good about many things that i said tonight but we should end with the toast. <laughs> really? Yes. Well, I would say this because, because you... you know why? You know why? It's okay. because we're not supposed to to nitpick. Right. Or nitpick. Like that's not helpful to anyone. I don't know. That's why. I will say this. Well, this is good. This is good. So I, I'm not making the toast. You're making the toast because you started I us on. Okay. You started us on like judging deacons and that's your thing. You're like, you just judge deacons all the time. <laughs> so the judging son of a biscuit. But anyway, what I would say is this in the time that we live in, in April of 2021, it is hard to find anything that you can say that someone doesn't get mad about. And that is still true. So what we have tried to do in this episode is have a conversation, say things that we believe are true, but not say them perfectly because who does? And then come to a conclusion at the end that we're all in the body of Christ and we're doing the best we can. Um, if anything, right now, we're, while we're recording this, Divine Mercy is coming up. This will air after Divine Mercy, most likely. But the idea in, in the readings of the gospels of divine mercy Sunday is that these are the disciples who saw him for three years. They believed they saw all the miracles and they still doubted like crazy and they still made mistakes. And Jesus still appeared to them and showed them and offered his wounds and was just so in love with them. So if we've offended deacons or priests or lay people or old fashioned connoisseurs, any of those things, we're really sorry and we're just doing the best we can to have a conversation. We're just two dads who like old fashions that like yeah. to talk about random crap. We're not experts in anything. So nothing don't take anything we say too seriously. If you don't like it, we're not any authority. Kiss off. That's what I would say. If you don't That's like right. it, kiss off. That's right. All right. Um, Lead it. It's your fault this, we're in this conversation. Oh man. Well, this is going to be a toast to the the saint of my my youth saint john paul ii who gave us the feast of divine mercy sunday coming up this sunday and the theology of the body which has influenced every part of our lives please bring us to heaven jp2 cheers cheers